excuse me. Uh, Jesse, what, what's going on over there? I'm, I'm a little concerned about this cough. Yeah. So uh, what people might not realize is that at this time of the year, Jewish people tend to have all sorts of weird stuff going on in our bodies, mostly related to, I guess, like early allergies. So in this era of coronavirus, it's very hard to know what's what, but I'm, I'm confident I'm not infected because I don't have other symptoms other than the dry cough. Um, but yeah, I just think people should know that this is a issue for a lot of us. We tend to be just sort of like congested, stuffed up, whiny. Um, you know that. I, wh- I whine to you a lot about. <laughs> whiny, rich, hoarding <laughs> yeah, gold. Exactly. We're going to get on the ADL's radar. But um, no, yeah. not to be clear, hashtag not all Jews, not all Jews get stuffed up and, and allergenic this time of year, but this particular Jew does. And I do not have the coronavirus. But. I also had a uh, health question for you, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, shoot. The end of our last podcast, uh, you left people on a cliffhanger. You said that you went out to gather some kind of like needle, right? Something you make pesto from. Okay, so this is how I can tell that you're that you're like a real indoor guy. Um, so it's not needles; it's nettles. Are you familiar with stinging nettles? I am. I am a city boy, but I'm familiar with uh, stinging nettles. Okay, so that's what I was collecting with stinging nettles, which are a food. You can actually eat them. They're like a a, a weed, essentially, that are um, like apparently very high in protein, and you can turn them into pesto or drink them as tea or whatever. And so one of my coronavirus, at least until the like the real lockdown. Now we're not supposed to really leave our leave our property, but except take the dog for walks or your cat for a walk if uh, if you can convince your cat to go for a walk. One of the things that I've been doing is going out and foraging for food in the woods. And and I am partly worried about food shortages in the, the time of coronavirus. Um, I We haven't seen any now as far as I'm aware, but I am actually like kind of worried about um, crops rotting in the fields as we're going to start to see happen, I think, more and more as both as immigration becomes more difficult and as, you know, farm workers are just sick. So one thing I've been doing is like telling my family and friends and now our listeners that I, if I were you, I would... Uh, I would try to find a local CSA wherever you are, um, which is just like a way of farmers selling directly to consumers. Um, Anyway, so that's not why I was hunting for stinging nettles. I was hunting for stinging nettles because there's fucking nothing else to do. Um, And it's also like fun to go out in the woods and like find shit to eat. Anyway, so I, as we talked about last time, I went like foraging for stinging nettles and I got a whole bunch and I brought them back and I made tea with it and I've been drinking tea all week. And then I found out that what I was eating or drinking was not stinging nettles. Um, and I found this out because my girlfriend went out and, and harvested stinging nettles and she got the actual good shit. Um, and it was not what, I, what we'd been drinking all week. So we have an app that's a, um, a plant identification app. And after a while, I remembered that I had it. And uh, so I, I identified what I had been drinking all week. And it turns out it's fine. It was a, a variety of blackberry. Um, it was a California blackberry. So not not the kind that fruits yet. Um, we have tons and tons of invasive um, blackberries in the Pacific Northwest. But this is a, a different kind. Anyway, so that's what I was drinking was tea made out of blackberries. As far as I know, no health effects. I mean, I might be stupider than I was a couple weeks ago, but that could be quarantine. That could be the weed. Honestly, who knows at this point? Yeah. I mean, that that's sort of a best case scenario if you drink an unidentified substance and then you're like, of all the outcome of possible things you could have ingested to find out it was blackberries strikes me as a, uh, a favorable roll of the dice. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. So, Katie, what podcast are we recording? <laughs> okay, so you are listening to Blocked and Reported, the one and only podcast about stupid internet bullshit on the internet. And I'm Katie Herzog, and you are my co-host, Jesse Single. That's my name. And today we are going to talk about, what are we talking about, Jesse? Well, we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about whether the culture wars have been murdered by coronavirus. And we're going to talk about Syro Rao, who is a leading um, anti-racist trainer with a very interesting approach, which is mostly yelling at white ladies. <laughs> it's, uh, she's sort of a dom, I would say. She's a white lady dom. <laughs> That's exactly it. So yeah, th- this whole issue of whether coronavirus is going to sort of kill the culture wars or put them on hold... A few people have actually asked me that, just sort of Twitter followers or, or people I was in this uh, Discord chat with. And I actually noticed the ladies on Red Scare, which is this very weird, funny, lefty podcast that people might want to check out. They made this argument in, in the following clip. And and for those unfamiliar with these terms, a, a TERF is a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. A SWERF is a sex worker exclusional radical feminist. You can look those terms up if you want. I have a horrible feeling, Katie, that we're going to be talking about both of them at some point. If not this episode. Yeah. I don't think we're going to be able to avoid that. 
<laughs> We're going to get slammed by Swerfs. Anyway, here's what the Red Scare lady said about all this. I really hope that this pandemic makes the terms swerf and turf obsolete. They already are. They are. They have been, yeah. I mean, the nice, the silver lining, of which there are many, is that, yeah, these SJ dubs have to confront the totally, like, morally, ethically, culturally bankrupt yeah. <laughs> foundation of their whole <laughs> paradigm. Meaningless and immaterial. Yeah. Katie, what's your read on this? Is this the sort of situation where we might actually see the dumbest aspects of the culture wars fade away for a while? Or do you think things are just going to snap back to normal after an initial shock or what? I've also gotten this question a few times, and I'm not sure what the answer is. I certainly find myself a little bit less interested in culture war stuff right now, which is maybe unfortunate considering that that's um, sort of the gist of this podcast. Um, It does feel a little bit less important right now that the world is ending. And I do, I find myself, like I follow people on Twitter who are still really in their, uh, in their culture war poses, you know, who are still really like battling out about language and race and gender and all this stuff. And I find myself just sort of watching like, like, why are we still talking about this? Then again, yesterday, a, a two-year-old tweet from the um, the queer magazine Them, which I think is maybe owned by Grindr or was owned by Grindr at some point, it referenced somebody who they called a non-binary woman. And the two the contradiction in those two terms was grating enough for me to just like retweet it and and like my commentary was just non-binary woman. And then like I, I'm like starting my own like dumb like culture war pylon of this stupid magazine because over a two-year-old tweet i didn't realize it was two years old at that time um but but it, you know and it did feel a little bit normalizing for a second like ah, i'm gonna get mad about this thing that ultimately doesn't really matter but it feels good in this this moment of utter panic um, <laughs> so i don't know what the answer is i mean i think probably some people will you know realize that none of this shit really matters and we'll move on and they won't they will not subscribe to this podcast and others will dig into it and i mean you're already seeing sort of um AOC will treat something about environmental racism in the time of Corona, and then the anti-woke uh, brigade will sort of jump on her. So I don't think it's totally going to go away. Maybe it's just pause for a moment, and um, we will resume our positions on the battlefield shortly. But I'm, I'm also not really sure. What do you think? I think you were venturing into dangerous territory with that, that tweet because – you're talking. Do you know like the whole deal with Steven Universe and Rebecca Sugar? No, please explain it. I can't really explain it except Steven Universe is a cartoon that is just has this incredibly, uh, profoundly enthusiastic fandom. Like they treat Steven Universe as this life changing show. I've never seen it. For all I know, it's good. Okay, and the so the 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 creator of the show is is the non binary yes. woman. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and their fans are just really. Some of them are crazy. Like there was this controversy where um this is not funny at all but but a fan artist who would draw steven universe characters ended up in the hospital after a suicide attempt because she was bullied so severely because like she would draw one character too fat another character too skinny she draw like a dark skin character a few shades too light and the tumblr brigade just just demolished this person with with online bullying over it i don't think you're susceptible to that but this is like a beloved figure so um be careful katie is this the anime avatar brigade? Is there a, is there a overlap of this uh, Venn diagram? Based on my my limited understanding, I would say there is significant overlap between those two groups. Right. So okay, avoid antagonizing the Steven Universe fans, even if the creator of the show goes by the completely incoherent term "non-binary woman." I mean, can you explain to me what a non-binary woman is? You're probably the worst person I could possibly ask. <laughs> But do you have any idea what a non-binary woman is? Uh, here, here's what I think it is. I think it's a lesbian. <laughs> or a person formerly known as a lesbian would qualify as a non-binary I woman. I think a lot of these... Proceed very carefully, Jesse. I'm going to put on my hat of extreme diplomacy. I think a lot of these labels are in flux. And people... You, you're, you're, a, you're a gender nonconforming person. Isn't it in certain ways difficult to be gender nonconforming? I bristle at that term because I think that the idea of gender nonconformity is so that's based on stereotypes, right? So, I mean, the thing that makes me gender nonconforming is like I'm a woman who wears pants or is it like I'm a woman who sleeps with women and have short hair? I just think it like my whole problem with this and this is not the turf, the the, the, the turf episode. Um, so we should probably save that for when we launch a, a Patreon. It's, right? it's becoming the um, turf episode. So, I mean, I my problem with this whole narrative is this 
all of this language, I think it really restricts the idea of what it is to be a woman or what it is to be a man. Um, I mean, I would call myself like a little bit androgynous, but gender nonconforming, I mean, that presupposes that gender is this sort of intractable thing and that anybody who like vaguely uh, transgresses a stereotype is somehow weird, um, which I don't believe. And I think that that putting labels on these things makes them a little bit more intractable and um, and and. And I don't know, it just it narrows the definition of what a woman can be or what a man can be rather than liberating us. That's interesting because when I when I say you're gender nonconforming, in my head, what I'm pointing out is that you defy certain longtime stereotypes of a woman. I'm not saying there's like some sure. internal essence of you that is not womanly. I'm saying that, yeah, and I think this is what it gets down to. Okay, so when someone says I'm a non-binary woman, it seems to be saying I'm a woman, but I reject certain traditional aspects or stereotypical aspects of womanhood. Right. Don't it sounds like that's what you say she is saying. Uh, yeah, I mean I think you're right about that, but I think that also except for I don't know like uh like the cath trad or trad cath or whatever they are like you'd have to be like a i don't know like a a fundamentalist to not defy you know some stereotypes of what a woman is um any right. woman with a job who doesn't you know work in the home um is defying de, you know defy defying a stereotype of what a woman is so i i have some of the same concerns you do that this is in certain ways not expanding the boundaries of gender but constricting them but I guess maybe the counter argument is language is weird. It's fluid. People are using the term non-binary in different ways. Maybe like 10 years from now, non-binary will just mean what, what butch means or something like that. It's also interesting to note that I, I just, I was curious about this. So I Googled, uh, Rebecca Sugar is married to a man. So oh, she's, she's not a, le- wow. Yeah, she's not a lesbian. So it seems to be maybe an aesthetic thing mostly. So she is gender conforming. <laughs> Wow. Okay. I'm, to the I'm kidding, I'm kidding. stereotypically yeah. so. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, that is. I would have just like based on like the the photo of her and, and the the image that that accompanied the them magazine article. I would not have pegged her as a straight lady, uh, or or they. What I'm not quite sure what uh what Rebecca Sugar's pronouns are. No, she uses it. She says she uses she. The reason I like talking about this with you is like the online discourse is so stupid and. You like if certain of our fans hear this, you will get treated as though you just committed a hate crime against her for questioning her use of a certain label, right? Right. Different people mean different things when they use these terms. And when people critique them, it's treated as though it's an assault on someone's very personhood. And I don't get the sense that you're saying like this person doesn't deserve to live or to express herself however she wants. You're just saying that if non-binary means you're not a man or a woman, to then say you're a non-binary woman is seems self-contradictory, right? Yeah, it just that's my problem with a lot of queer dogma right now is that I think it's really incoherent. Uh, she's not the only the only person who you know puts these two terms together. Jonathan Van Ness, who's on Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, or maybe it's just called Queer Eye now. Um, he goes by he, and he calls himself a non-binary man. And I just like I find the two when you put those two words together, don't they cancel each other out? I mean, that's just sort of my perspective on this. Is like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I think, I mean, I I agree with you in terms of just like language should be logical and should point to specific things. But what's your counterpoint if someone would accuse you of, I think, policing their identities is the phrase they'd be most likely to use. I don't think I'm policing it. I think I'm critiquing their use of language. Um, I, I, that Yeah, that's something that I'm sure I would get be I'm sure I would be accused of policing of erasure, if not like literal murder. Um, but I don't think, you know, for me, it's just I'm critiquing the concept of non-binary women and non-binary men. I, I frankly, I don't understand it. And I've asked people to explain this to me. I've asked non-binary people to explain this to me. And their explanations still, to me, seem incoherent. Like if I, okay, I have a, I have a friend who, uh, who is non-binary. And I asked this person about a month ago, like, can you just like, explain to me what this means. And what my friend said was, you know, sometimes I feel like a man and sometimes I feel like a woman. And I said like, okay, what does it feel like 
to feel like a man. And my friend said, well, sometimes I want to wear butch clothes and sometimes I want to wear femme clothes. And to me, like, that's just a reference to stereotypes and style. There's a lot to the idea that when you sort of reify the internal concept of feeling like a man or a woman, that's a fraught exercise. And that brings certain risks, especially if you're talking about younger people who are still figuring out their identity. Like, I don't want an effeminate gay boy to feel like he can't be effeminate and gay and also a boy. And when I was growing up, I mean, people would call kids fags like it was nothing. It was just like a normal way to talk to people. It was actually a really big advance that kids could present in different ways and still be treated decently. And the number of places in which they are treated decently, I think, is expanding outward, which is good. So I guess the argument is, do you want to internalize in teenagers the message that if you act or present in a certain way, you're something other than a man or something other than a woman? And and to me, I view that as a very different question from kids who have severe gender dysphoria, where it's just, it's not, it's a non-starter. They cannot present as a man or a woman. It causes them deep pain. And I've interviewed those kids and I think their stories are are completely legit, but this strikes me as like a different, more aesthetic thing. Do you think I have that distinction right? Yeah, I think you do have that distinction right. And I think that both of us are going to get canceled all over again uh, for the fact that you're getting that distinction right. Um, But this stuff all might disappear in the next 10 years. I think that's also totally possible that it's possible that 10 years from now, it will be more accepted and more common in society. And it's also possible that this will be a temporary blip. And 10 years from now, we'll all be going, hey, remember when all those people identified on as non-binary? Wasn't that weird? Um, but what I hope is that like, for young people and for old people, you can you can say to yourself, I'm a woman who who likes girls or I'm I'm a butch woman or whatever and that doesn't mean rejecting your sex or or your gender or your place as a woman in the world cuz frankly like it seems a little bit anti-feminist to say like uh you know girls who like baseball girls who like short hair and other girls or whatever aren't girls. Yeah, I guess well, two final points. One is that, that that point that like 10 years from now, things might be very different, I think is important. And people suffer from a certain kind of present bias where it's like whatever's going on now, you have to defend it. That's the only way to social justice. But like three or four years ago, New York City put out these – this like um, their Human Rights Commission or whatever put out this document and it included all these strange pronoun, pronouns, Zazim, all that stuff. And I feel like three or four years ago, that was really big and we thought that by now – You know, there'd be a million different pronouns in common use. But from what I can tell, like that was one instance in which the Tumblr to reality pipeline sort of got clogged a little bit. And we actually, if anything, you see fewer people these days like using unusual pronouns, right? Or is that not true in your part of the country? Uh, they is incredibly common. Yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, I mean like Z, Fay. Right, Z, Zir, It, yeah. I, that seems to have gone kind of by the wayside. Yeah, I I do not see like a whole bevy of pronouns, but I what is common is they as the, the singular they, and it's also incredibly common for people, cis people and trans people and non-binary people or whatever, to advertise their pronouns all the time yeah like in your email signature when you meet people um the guy who officiated my wedding asked what my girlfriend or my now wife asked what our pronouns were um which i found sort of strange because like my name is katie and i hope that i look enough like a female for people to peg me as a female i mean honestly like part of the reason this stuff bothers me is because it's sort of personal because as a butch woman as a you know gender non-conforming woman I'm the exact type of person who people assume is not a female. And before, like before they became, you know, the sort of thing that had pervaded that had pervaded the culture, I lived as an adult. I like looked like enough like a woman that people thought that I was a woman. I mean, I'm, I'm, sometimes I would get mistaken for a, for a man or a boy, which is extremely funny when people would like think that my girlfriend was my mother. Um, which <laughs> happens. Like most often on public transit and in airports for some reason. Like I'm like I'm like going <laughs> like I'm a 17 year old like angrily going on vacation with my mom, um, but so since they has since has become this popular term, pe- I get they all the fucking time and I find it offensive. I do and and I find it offensive in part because nobody likes to be misgendered, including me. And they is a pronoun and it's not mine. And but it's this idea that like oh because you look butch because you're gender nonconforming somehow you're not a woman. Um, it just it makes me mad and it like and you know my girlfriend doesn't get they'd she's femme she never gets they'd I get they'd right and people don't and like mostly by queer people or like people like like queer people or or allies who think that they are 
doing the right thing by constantly asking me what my fucking pronoun is. Like, my name is Katie. I have a vagina. What do you think my pronoun is? Zier. You're making the same point that got ContraPoints in trouble. And I'll, I'll link to this in the show notes. But she got in a lot of trouble online because she's a um, you know, female presenting binary trans woman. And she said like all these sort of nice liberal ladies uh, who would always just obsessively ask people about the pronouns and provide their own. They made her feel bad because from her point of view, she's like, well, clearly I'm trying to present as a woman. Clearly I'm a woman. Why would you ask me that? So I think there's some like, I think it's not automatically the best idea to always ask about pronouns and have that be a common part of the thing. Cause there also might be situations where someone doesn't want to reveal the pronoun right away to a perfect stranger. I, I just think this and so many other aspects of the gender culture wars is maybe a little bit more complicated than people give it credit for. No, I think you're totally right. Um, which is, you know, thank God that we're here to explain it to them. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're definitely the right people to do that. Also, yeah. we just accidentally recorded half of our, uh, <laughs> of an upcoming episode, but we'll keep that on the DL for now. Uh, Okay. Is that enough problematic gender talk? Should we move on to the next thing? Yes. So one reason I'm I'm skeptical that the coronavirus is going to slow down the culture wars was this ridiculous thing on Twitter, maybe a couple weeks ago now. Uh, Do you know the name Jill Filipovich? I did not know how to pronounce it until right right this moment, but yes, I I do. Filipovich. Yeah. She's just like, she's she's a good writer. She's a liberal feminist writer. She's written a book or two. Um, I don't know like what the full – I think I met her maybe once in person. She's a nice lady. I like her work. But So she tweeted out, uh, quote, Spain is deploying its army to help manage their coronavirus outbreak and not to be insensitive at an anxiety-inducing time. But uh, I think I speak for all New Yorkers when I say, Spain, hi, can you deploy some of that in our direction? We will comply with your orders. And then it's this photo of these um, – I think it's safe to say very hot, very buff members of the Spanish military. And when I read that, I retweeted. I was like, oh, this is funny. This is bringing some levity to a ridiculous situation. But as is often the case, there was a big chunk of Twitter that strongly disagreed with that. And I guess this was best summed up by a social justice I think she's a an anth- uh, medical anthropologist in training. She has like 70,000 followers named Zoe Samudzi. She said... Still laughing at Filipovich being horny for the Spanish Legion. There's a weird and specific kind of normalization of state violence and authoritarianism that comes from aesthetic obsessions and lusting over hot, muscular police officers and servicemen. So to me, it's like, what I find interesting about this is I want to know, like, Jill Filipovich posts what is obviously a joke. Look at these hot Spanish army dudes. Why can't they come over here? To read that and to think that in any way she is defending fascism or attracted to fascism is just in such a different universe from the one I inhabit that I'm curious whether the people typing that – and this became like a two-day event on Twitter among people who hate Joe Filipovich for not being lefty enough or whatever. Like, Do they actually believe that when they're typing it? Are they that brainwashed or is it pure – opportunism because they know they'll get likes and retweets from it oh the god that's a great question um i don't know um because i'm not in their brains thank god i mean i i try to assume <laughs> thank god i try to assume good faith even when people are being complete idiots so i but i also like i don't know anything about the current state of spanish politics right now like like, is the Spanish army fascist right now? I mean, this is not a historic picture. This right. is not like from the 1930s or 40s, right? So these are these guys. I don't think you quite did it justice uh, describing it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that real quickly. The Spanish military uniform is seemingly designed by a, a so like a gay fashion designer who wanted to show as much skin as possible. <laughs> Like they have like it's like a their their shirts are all unbuttoned down to like the like the breastbone. Um, (laughs) Their crotches are so incredibly tight that you can like see their genitals through the crotches. The the, the uniforms are also like like teal and green. Um, So I think I'm not going to lie. They're making me question my own sexuality. Me too. Me too. Um, They're extremely fucking hot and also extremely gay looking, um, which I think is also one of those sort of the funny things about this, about this uh, sort of imagining this army, you know, in 
engage in any sort of battle. Not that gay men can't fight. I've uh, I've seen a few drag shows. Wow, Katie. Wow. Canceled. These are not like men in like SS uniforms or even like NYPD uniforms. These are like men who look like they're about to like march on a fucking runway. <laughs> yeah. Um, they really do. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Do these people like actually... Uh, is the Spanish military actually engaged in some sort of fascism? I mean, that would be sort of worth knowing. Yeah, um, no, and- I, I think it. I think this is a Spanish legion, which is a branch of the Spanish military that I'm sure in the past, given what Spain is as a colonial power. But to me, it's like if someone posted a photo of a hot cop and was like, that's a hot cop. And then I was like, well, what about Rodney King? <laughs> right. It's just like such, right. it's such a fundamentally bad faith, just like. It's like it's being a Twitter cop, basically. Right, right. We will not maybe make a habit of like breaking down individual Twitter blowups. But to me, this is such an example of how there is a type of person who is literally just looking at stuff to get pissed off about. And it this vision of social media as this freewheeling, creative, fun hangout space, which if anything, it should be now because like we're all about to die of the coronavirus and like at least get us let us get some funny tweets off first. It just I don't know. People like like this Zoe person just sort of make it miserable. And that's not to say that people should excuse like genuinely offensive stuff, but I don't know. I just hate this idea that like, I can't make a dumb, slightly edgy joke without, you know, becoming a two day thing on Twitter. And I, I feel bad that uh, Jill had to go through this, but. Right. I wonder if in, in some way though, like it, it benefits Zoe because she gets all this sort of attention. And I think in some way being a, you know, at the center of a pylon, if you are a certain a certain kind of I don't think like for the individual this this is true but if you're you know a certain blue check mark on Twitter it can benefit you in some ways um, for instance right now we are discussing this on our very important podcast yes that's a good point yeah we just devoted God knows how many minutes I think we've been talking about this for six hours now right yeah yeah since yeah. Uh, since last episode I haven't stopped thinking about it <laughs> uh, well so let's move on to um some uh, interesting media news, right? A big congratulations to uh, Syra Rao. Um, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name, but Syra Rao is a, what is her job actually? Okay, so she's an anti-racist trainer who I think she lives in like the Denver area or something like that. Um, She's of Indian descent and she has become famous on Twitter for essentially using her platform to drag white women. Um, So, I'm going to read a couple of her of her recent tweets. Th- these are all within like the last month or so. I had hundreds, thousands to search through. I mean, she this woman tweets about... I'm so sorry you had to do that, by the way. Yeah, I should get hazard pay for uh, having to search Cyra Rao's Twitter. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read a few of these. These are all recent. And this is... These were just like the first ones that came up. These are not sort of the best of Cyra Rao. Okay, here's one from February 11th. My daughter and I just did some research on movies we could see this weekend. Sonic the Hedgehog, Doolittle, Gretel and Hansel, Little Women. White girls, white boys, white women, white women. <laughs> Wonder why kids of color feel erased, invisible, and how do they and how they grow up to feel the same. I mean, this one's Wait, amazing. Just Sonic because, the Hedgehog? I know, I know. Like, he's, it's like, blue. He's, he's blue. blue. He's blue. He's blue. He's blue. So she's like a real life Tatiana McGrath, who is a parody um, created by this guy, Andrew Doyle in the UK, who, who is just like, like, the absolute parody of like the wokest social media justice warrior. Okay, so here's here's one that I really like. Carol Baskin is a white woman. Carol Baskin from the yeah. from the Tiger so show. Carol Baskin is uh, a she's a woman who runs like a tiger rescue center um, somewhere on the East Coast, and she's featured in this like fantastic wild new documentary on Netflix called Tiger King, and the woman is accused of like among other crimes killing her husband and feeding him to a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but, but to Sarah Rao, like the important thing here isn't that she like potentially killed her husband. It's that she's a white woman. Katie, Katie, do you know who else was a white woman? Who? Hitler. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Ava Braun there, but you are right. Okay. Here's one from March 11th. So like heart of the pandemic. The world is in chaos, but one thing remains steady. White women's racism. Here's one from March 3rd. America hates folks who are black, brown, poor, disabled, LGBTQ, Muslim youth. Anyone who is not rich, white, and male, America hates you. Here's one from March 8th. White liberals and moderates are going to kill us again, same as it ever was. And so she's one of these people. Oh, here's here's actually, here's a great one. Who needs... (laughs) 
Who needs enemies when you have white women friends? So she's one of these people who like, instead of like focusing her ire on, you know, like conservatives or actual racists or people who like, I don't know, maybe like voted for Donald Trump. She like mostly focuses her anger on like liberal white women. And so she has created this, uh, this, I guess it's a nonprofit called Race to Dinner with a, a woman named Regina Jackson. And what they do is, they they have somehow convinced white women to pay them $2,500 to go to their home and yell at them about how racist they are. It's about time, Katie. It's about time. Right, right. So so this is a great opportunity. If any of you want to get educated by Sarah Rao, you can just pay her $2,500 and like over, I don't know, like pasta, she'll come to your house and like tell you how fucking horrible you are. And people really do this. The Guardian uh, wrote an article recently about race to dinner, about their thing. Um, and they interviewed these, they interviewed these women who are mostly like upper middle class, you know, liberal white women, probably Hillary Clinton voters and Elizabeth Warren voters about why they, you know, why they wanted to engage in this. And 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 here's a quote from the Guardian piece um, about like during this during this dinner, they this this one woman was talking about what like like her own racism, racism, her own crimes. And a quote from the Guardian piece is that this woman admits she recently did nothing when someone patronizingly commended her for adopting two black children as though she had saved them. So it's stuff like that, these like microaggressions that these women are are apparently engaging in and they're so right. like chagrined over it and so guilty over it that they're willing to like pay these women to um to come re-educate them and maybe uh, leave them of their original sin of being born so, white women. So, so to be clear, like the kinds of women this is targeting we're not talking about like wobbly trump voters or or people looking to leave like right-wing evangelical churches these are people who none of this means they're they're not you know implicitly biased or whatever but these are these are liberal voters who are sort of committed to anti-racism that's who is paying $2500 to have a dinner where they're sort of have this visceral confrontation with their racism um via two women of color right it's people who feel guilty because of people like Sarah, Sarah Rao. I mean, she's really created this sort of um, excellent grift for herself. And I, I don't like the word grifter in part because I, I uh, people call me a grifter all the time and I'm like, where's my fucking money? But she uh, does seem like a grifter. She has convinced these people to pay her tons of money. And also not only that, she's wealthy. Her husband is like an investment banker or something like that. She ran for Congress. Um, I don't know if she has a day job outside of educating these, re-educating these white women. But the woman is by like most metrics other than the color of her skin, um, she's fucking privileged. That's what's so interesting about I mean, I, I when I Wikipedia her, I think it says um University of Virginia and NYU Law School, both of which are sort of top tier institutions. And well it's just interesting because like the the kinds of women who are inviting her to dinner also went to places like NYU and Virginia. They're sort of the Guardian article mentions these are like nice homes the dinners are taking place in and it's like this weird It's a circle jerk. I it's mean, an it, anti-racist it, circle. Yeah, it's a circle jerk. But you know what? It's it's also a weird kind of tokenism because it's not like it's not like the traditional like there's a classic Seinfeld where uh, George wants to prove to everyone he has a black friend. He like takes a photo with this black guy he he barely knows. This is like that, except look at my person of color yelling at me about how racist I am. That's how they sort of demonstrate that they're they're sincere in their anti-racism efforts and i guess like i don't want to i don't want to drag any white person for not you know sitting with the possibility they're implicitly biased or that they have unearned privilege because i'm pretty orthodox liberal and a lot of that stuff but just that question of what you're going to do with your privilege and the and the best way to actually make the world a better place i mean wh- what do you think is the the best case let's try to be sympathetic here there was one instance in the in the Guardian article where I think after one of these dinners, a woman went and like volunteered or did did something vaguely good. But but do you think that's the norm? No. I feel like people just get sucked into more and more self evaluation and self flagellation. No, I mean this. It strikes me as the whole thing kind of very Catholic. You know, you sort of buy your indulgences, yeah. and then you're you're not one of the bad ones. Um, yeah, I mean, I can think of uh, about a billion better ways to spend your money than giving it to Syra Rao. Um, <laughs> like if if you could literally twenty five hundred dollars is like. How much do you think one school lunch for like a low income kid costs? Oh my fucking god! I mean, like five bucks. Yeah, yeah, it's a- yeah. Like go to if you like it. Like I commend people who want to confront their own sort of and in, in, 
you know, implicit bias if, if we want to call it that. But come on, like spend your money on a good fucking cause. And this is not a good cause. And, and I mean, the reason we're talking about this, I don't know if I mentioned this at the top. So she just, Syra Rao just got a book deal um, with Penguin Random House. So this was, so, right. so this is sort of the other maddening thing about this is that this woman who is who is speaking for basically nobody, um, you know, has, is now like, is going to be publishing a, like a, probably the, you know, the, the next like Robin D'Angelo hit about what's wrong with white women. Um, yeah. She's co-authoring it with, uh, Regina Jackson, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and no, Robin D'Angelo, uh, and again, we'll, um, we're going to be in the habit of like, if we mention a name, listeners might not know, we'll always put a link in the show notes. So you can always check there to explain, but Robin D'Angelo, um, wrote a book about sort of how white people need to confront their their whiteness, basically. And she's the most popular, I think, anti-racism educator in the country right now. And what's so interesting is like, she's a white lady and Syra Rao is from sort of these upper middle class institutions. So when liberal white women confront their racism or want to, it seems like they like, they go to the sort of person who is like them and similar to them, who they, who they will be comfortable around. This isn't you know, learning more about the the worst schools in your district or your neighborhood and how to help them. This isn't about actually engaging with people suffering from poverty or structural oppression. It's very, very, you can sit at home and comfortably read about this or even have a woman come to you to yell at you about it. It's such, like you said, it's very, um, it's very religious. And it, it's, I just, it, it upsets me because it seems like such a massive distraction and it seems so unlikely to ever lead to any sort of lasting societal progress. Yeah, I cannot see how this is going to benefit anybody except for Syra Rao and Regina Jackson. Um, yeah, and, and I think Syra Rao is the, is, you know, we know who she is because of her insane Twitter presence. Um, if she didn't have this, you know, if she didn't, seemingly purposefully sort of lean into this kind of trollish Tatiana McGrath behavior. Nobody would know who the fuck she was. Um, you know, so we're also, I guess, part of the problem by like giving a shit and giving her any attention. But this whole thing just seems so insane. Like, come on. Like there are, there race, racism clearly exists in the world and giving to Syra out $2,500 is not going to, going to solve that. Problem. That's it. You could literally take that $2,500 and just go to the, the poorest zip code in your state and dump that money in a park and you would literally do more good than sitting in on one of these trainings. You could donate to Blocked and Reported and it would literally do more good than... Uh, that would be the <laughs> best way to end racism in America is to donate. We'll include our Venmos in the show notes. We have... Well, this show is hosted by a, a, a Jew with allergies and a non-binary <laughs> lesbian. <laughs> oh, man. Um... I guess, okay, you've written a little bit about this, but there is this thing where like, so I, I, I'm i a white guy, as you may be aware. Uh, are you though? You know, are, are we <laughs> am I really? <laughs> what are the racial boundaries of Judaism yeah. and caucasity? Cock, yeah. um, there's obviously the performative like <clears throat> Sarah John, oh, white, white guys are the worst, blah, blah, blah. That stuff doesn't bother me. It does seem like white women are singled out in a different way. And I yeah. think you've written a little bit about this. Like they're all lumped together, even though they're totally different. And do you think part of this is just like women are socialized to be nicer and more receptive to criticism, whereas men are socialized? Like if someone calls me a name, my reaction is not, oh, what if they're right? It's more like, fuck you. I don't know. I mean, it could be that. I think there's also something about women being worse to each other uh, than they are to men. I mean, yeah, you guys are vicious. Yeah, women can be super vicious. Um, and so, like, w when you refer to uh, right. that, I've written about this. So, I've written about the narrative after the Trump election that white women, 52% of white women who voted, voted for Donald Trump. I guess that was the statistic. The only explanation for why these white women would have voted for Donald Trump was like because they're sexist, because they're racist. Right. Other than the fact that like, well, for a lot of people, for most Americans, actually, you vote on party lines. Yeah. And, you know, there's issues like abortion, which, you know, I think it's ridiculous that this is, you know, one of the most divisive issues in America, but it is. And a lot of women are anti-abortion and they're even they're going to vote for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton because of that one issue, even if Donald Trump is a human abortion has, you know, I don't know how many fucking abortions he's probably paid for. Obviously, like it's not coherent, but if the idea is to like get pro-life, you know, judges on the Supreme Court, this is how they're going to vote. 
you know, and it's just, it's just like way more complex than just like white woman bad, white woman holding up white supremacy. I think, I mean, I, I feel, don't know. I feel like Donald Trump has, has both been responsible for abortions directly and that some of his press conferences could cause spontaneous abortions. <laughs> Well, that would be one upside. That's why they should start. They should start airing them on KOW, so we can um, get some free abortions going. On. But I think, but I think you're raising an important point, which is um, when you make big stereotypical claims about huge heterogeneous groups white people, black people, Asians, whatever. One problem with that is that they're often immoral. So if you if you treat black people as like Criminals, that's obviously immoral because you're, it's unfair to treat individuals in that way. The other problem is that it's stupid. It leads you to faulty conclusions. So when people talk about, you know, black culture as if it's a monolithic thing leading to black crime, that's ridiculous because if you ask anyone who actually studies crime, it's much more complicated than that. It has to do with poverty. It has to do with like the fact that tiny groups of kids can, can cause gang warfare in a neighborhood, even when 99% of people are law abiding. There's a similar thing going on here, and I think this is where people get confused because I don't I'm not deeply viscerally offended by people making dumb sweeping statements about white people, although, you know, you shouldn't be surprised when people then say they're gonna vote for Trump because they're not as woke as you. But it is stupid if you want to explain why white people are voting for Trump to attribute it to their whiteness. Because for any given white person, if you control for their education level, right off the bat, you will see a huge divide with college going white voters much more likely to vote for the Democrat, non-college voters, much more likely the Republican. Um, and if you don't acknowledge that complexity, if you treat people as big, undifferentiated groups, you will just get basic shit wrong over and over and over, even setting aside the moral issues with, with racism. Oh, totally. And, you know, there's this idea that somebody like Sarah, Sarah Rao can't be racist because she's a person of color and only white people can be racist because only white people have power. And to me that like that shows one of the faults of this sort of current iteration of, of intersectional thinking because intersectional apparently doesn't include class. You know, you have right. somebody who she, Sarah Rao ran for Congress. Her husband is a wealthy investment banker or something like that. She just got a book deal from fucking Penguin Random House and we're arguing that she doesn't have power. Yeah, it makes no sense. It makes no and, sense. And it, it's also just, I mean that I understand like, uh, in the United States, anti-white racism is not a major problem. And anyone who focuses on that, I think, you know, probably has an agenda very different from mine. But to just sort of flatly state there is no such thing as racism except directed at people of color, it's like saying, you know, because poison ivy is a lot less toxic than um, arsenic. Poison ivy isn't toxic. It's like, no, it, it's also toxic. It's just much less so. And yeah, the conversation about this is really silly. And I just think the class thing is exactly right because I am sure Sarah Rao experiences racism with like online trolls and with like certain isolated instances in day to day life. But if you went to these educational institutions and had the opportunities and background that she has in America in 2020, it is hard to see how you are oppressed. And I know some people find that controversial, but it's just class really can undo a lot of stuff, basically. Right. And she also benefits from her race in this case. I mean, this job that she's created for herself. Well, she is in this position because she's a woman of color. I mean, this idea that, you know, um, that people of color can only only be hurt by their by their their skin tone and not benefit from it. Just to me, it just like doesn't doesn't, you know, pan out to real life. Yeah. La uh, last year, I wrote a really wrote last year. I read a really good book. Uh by a woman named Elizabeth Lash Quinn. I think it came out uh, 2001. It's called Race Experts, How Sensitivity Training, Interracial Etiquette, and New Age Therapy Hijacked the Civil Rights Revolution. This is a wonderful book for anyone who wants to understand this stuff because I think a lot of people think that uh, Cyro Rao or Robin D'Angelo maybe represent new phenomena and, and you know they'll blame it on whatever they're current political bugaboo is this stuff has been around forever like ever ever since the civil rights movement saw its first successes with these you know big mlk-ish universalist appeals we just need to treat everyone the same don't look at the color of people's skins there's been this sort of left-wing backlash to that that has sought a more radical therapeutic route where the whole goal is to sort of force white people into confrontations and force this sort of like almost like a, a forensic evaluation of white people's own souls. The idea being that if white people look inward enough, they will like eventually become less racist. Although it's never quite explained how that happens or, or how it benefits anyone. So 
I will, uh, yeah, I'll include a link to that book in the show notes too, but I highly recommend it. Oh, I, I think it was very generous of you to assume that white people have souls, Jesse. Thank you for that. <laughs> I uh, I'm not. I don't think I have a soul. I, don't, I also don't think I have a gender identity. So yeah, I don't believe in the soul or the gender identity. So or free will. So if any, so if uh, if we get canceled for this podcast, um, it's not our fault. It's also just like okay, let let's just say hypothetically that I'm a bad person, uh, which I know is going to be hard. Yeah, hypothetically, <laughs> if I'm a bad person at at in my mid 30s, having racked up all sorts of activities and written a bunch of stuff. I just like to think that people will attribute my badness to something other than being white. Like, be more creative. You have so much to draw upon. Same with you. Like, if someone dislikes you, they there's so much other stuff than the color of your skin that's much more interesting to go with, right? Yeah, my fucking horrible personality. Um, yep, there's that. For one. Uh, you drink, you're drinking random pine needles totally. in the middle of a forest. Uh, yeah, plus I'm a drug abuser. There's also that. I smoke a ton of weed. I mean, there's many more explanations than, than the, my, the fact that I sunburn easily. Should we uh, should we close this out? Yeah, I think we've. Um, I don't want to be overconfident, but I think we've solved race relations. <laughs> I think we have. So uh, donate to Blocked and Reported twenty five hundred dollars. <laughs> keep going. We will come to dinner and we will yell at you so viciously and personally. Send a photo first so that we can make fun of your physical features. Yeah, you know what? We'll do it for half discount. I'll do it. I will come. To, I will come to dinner at your house for only five hundred dollars. I'm going to undercut Katie. I'll do it for. I'll do it for four fifty, but I get to choose the menu. This has been Blocked and Report. Email us at blocked and reported podcast at gmail.com. We we're on Twitter. We're at the bar pod, T H E B A R P O D. Bar is blocked and reported. We are not a podcast about bars, although maybe we will uh, change formats. And then, um, yeah, we're on all the major platforms now. Definitely rate and review us on iTunes. We're keeping that part of the appeal to the end of the show so that only the true fans will hear that and give us great reviews. I'm Jesse Single, and remember, white people have skulls that are the wrong shape. And I'm Katie Herzog. And also remember, if Jesse sneezes near you, it's not COVID, he's just Jewish. Jewish.